So Trident is an interesting project. Right? Trident is something that we are very proud of as a team, right? This ability to dynamically provision storage into Kubernetes, into these orchestrated container environments. Right? Again, enabling the consumption of storage at the application level. So that way, they don't have to understand. They don't have to care. Interestingly, we actually call Kubernetes, or excuse me, we call Trident a storage orchestrator. I have briefly mentioned this before, right? I can define a storage class, gold, as being multiple different things simultaneously. Solid fire with a particular QS policy. On tap with a particular aggregate. On tap with a particular disk type. Right? E-series with a particular disk type or pool. And Trident will manage provisioning resources across those different disparate pools of resources. When the application says, I need gold, it simply looks at those resources and determines which is the best fit for that particular request. So we rely on Trident to manage the storage for us, to create, destroy, to make accessible all of those resources to the application. But containers aren't the end all be all, right? Desired state configuration is something that has been around for a long time. Typically, for those of us who are operations guys, infrastructure guys, we look at things like Puppet Chef as the ability to configure a physical server, right? I want to go in and I want to install an operating system on this virtual machine, or I want to install an operating system on this server. I want to make my on-top system look like this. But applications guys take a different approach. An application guy is defining the application through code. I want to deploy this RPM. I want to configure it this way. I want to have this code pulled down. I want to execute this process at startup. The goal is the same. I want to encapsulate what that application looks like. Remember before, I stated that much of this is superseded, right, or at least collapsed and simplified leveraging containers. Where no longer do I have to have, for complex applications, one or two or five people who are doing nothing more than maintaining a puppet manifest or writing chef recipes on how to deploy my application. Instead, they're simply doing things like creating a Docker Compose file that explains how the application is defined. So it gets significantly easier, right? Our goal is to be able to reproducibly deploy the application across infrastructures. My laptop, my on-premises data center, my hyperscale cloud. We want it to be consistent, reliable. We want to ensure that we are getting the same thing regardless of where we're deploying it. So when we look at these, there are three that are very clear leaders. Puppet and Chef, arguably the two oldest of these, right? I believe Puppet was the first. Chef was a fork of Puppet, if I remember correctly. Right? They've been around for well over a decade at this point. They have been around long enough that basically everybody and everything integrates with it, not the least of which includes NetApp, right? where our modules are, again, upstream inside of Puppet. Ansible is the new kid on the block. Started out as an independent startup. They were recently acquired by Red Hat. Same principle. The NetApp modules for ONTAP, SolidFire, E-Series all exist upstream. If you install Ansible 2.3 or above, the NetApp modules are there. We can simply consume them. And it's important to note that we focus with these configuration management tools on the consumption of storage first. How many times do you add a new aggregate to ONTAP? How many times do you add a new storage virtual machine to ONTAP? How many times do you add new nodes to a solid fire array? Not often. Once a year, depending on your purchase cycle. How often do you provision a volume? How often do you create a volume clone if you're a developer? So the goal is, let's take these lightweight, mundane tasks and offload them to the automation tools. So how did we pick these three for our first and primary integrations? Well, it was pretty easy and pretty obvious. Again, this comes from the OpenStack user survey from this year, from April of this year. But you'll notice that Ansible is far and away at the top. Red Hat has had significant success, to say the least, with Ansible. They leverage it for all of their products and all of their integrations at this point, RHEL OSP, OpenShift, et cetera. Moving down the line, right, Puppet, Chef, you see at number three and number four, excuse me, number two and number four, respectively. You'll note that Fuel is also on there. So I don't talk about Fuel in this talk primarily because, well, one, it's really built on Puppet. But two, we also primarily see Fuel specifically for deploying OpenStack infrastructure, not necessarily applications built on top of there. So desired state configuration tools are but one part of the toolbox, right? And 
the reason why I say that, the reason why I call it a toolbox, is because ultimately all of these things together work in order to achieve that end outcome. So the last section that I'll cover is continuous integration and continuous deployment. Right? This is the concept of, well, constantly testing my code. Every time a commit happens, or whatever my policy happens to be, I want to build the application. I want to test it. I want to make sure that it is behaving the way that I expect it to. This is a principle that NetApp internally has adopted in spades. My own team, our engineers, operate in an agile methodology. We have a CI system that every time that we make commits into the master, into the, uh, the master release, we build, we test, we validate. The deployment cycle, which right now we're on roughly a quarterly primary release with secondary releases happening as needed, it's all automated. Nobody goes in and clicks a button. Nobody has to type at the keyboard. It's simply a git commit that makes all of this happen. So it's something that we see both internally as well as externally. Continuous deployment refers to, well, taking that the next step. Not only did my application successfully compile and not have any errors, but now I want to push it out into production. So there's hundreds, maybe even thousands of tools that are all capable of doing this, ranging from my own created bash scripts, Perl, Python, whatever I happen to be using, to actual full finished products. By far, the most common one that we encounter when we're looking at on-premises data center deployments is Jenkins, without a doubt. Even though there's many, many other companies, including many that are cloud-based, right? I simply point at my GitHub repository and every time something changes, go and rebuild it and test it. Right? Jenkins is the one that we encounter most frequently. Inside of the Jenkins ecosystem, we do have a, a NetApp plugin, right? We do have a Jenkins plugin that's available from our GitHub site that's capable of doing these exact same kind of operations, right? I want to clone a volume. I want to create a developer workspace, which is one of the more interesting ones. This is sort of an extension to what is known as our Code Easy project. Turns out that, well, we discovered that creating a developer environment takes a lot of time. Checking out code, making sure that all the dependencies, that all of the tools that they need are all accessible. So internally, we created a, call, a tool called Bam Bam. We took that and we turned it into an open source tool known as Code Easy. And we took that and we turned it into a Jenkins plugin. So now, using, again, those tools that they're already using, I can now go in and say, give me a developer environment. And within a few minutes, they have everything that they need. But I also like to bring up Jenkins because Jenkins, through things like Pipeline, also takes advantage of all of these other tools that we've talked about. <laughs> now I can encode, document exactly what is my test and deployment process. And if I don't want to use a particular tool, maybe I don't want to use the Jenkins plugin because everything's already defined in Puppet manifests. Great, leverage Puppet, take advantage of that. I just need to deploy my application into Kubernetes, fantastic. Jenkins can take advantage of all of those things. It's a fantastically flexible tool. So the moral of the story with Jenkins in particular is, well, it takes advantage of all of those other things. But it also has its own goodness. So the last tool that I like to talk about is JFrog. JFrog seems like it's a little out of place, right? It's not something that we commonly think about, especially as infrastructure right, administrators, especially, especially as a storage admin. But Artifactory is a repository. When I compile my application, I end up with a bunch of binaries, right, a bunch of other libraries that I may need. I want to store those somewhere. And I want to store those in a revisioned manner. So that way I can go back and say, well, version 1.1.3.4, yeah, that was the last version that worked. Let me test against those libraries. Right, and I can pull those out. So what if I could go in and I could do things like clone that underlying set of repository, excuse me, libraries, binaries, and attach it to my test environment so I can do testing on previous versions, make sure that I'm not having any reversions in my code as I go forward. What if I want to test a bug fix and see how far back that bugs got fixed. Leveraging underlying storage features, flex clones, for example, in ONTAP, right? Volume clones in SolidFire, to enhance that operation, reduce it down to a few seconds in time, is a powerful tool for those application developers. So sometimes we have to think a little bit out of the box. Sometimes we have to think about things differently and take the approach of a storage knowledgeable developer. People like Kapil, who spent time developing, banging away at a keyboard. People like Mr. Garrett Mueller, off to my side, 
right, who has spent time as a kernel developer inside of OMTAP, right, brings that approach, brings that mindset into how can I leverage storage to the maximum benefit of the application. So more or less, I've covered my conclusion. Right? I've hopefully inculcated you enough throughout this presentation that storage is not just a resource. Storage is not something that I have to tolerate sulking down to the storage team's desk and begging for more capacity. Right? I don't want to provision storage. I don't want to consume storage in 2017 the same way that I did in 1989. It's a generic LUN. It's a generic thing at the end of the wire. But at the same time, I don't want to have to worry about the details. I want to consume storage. I want to consume storage features. I want to maximize the benefit of that platform. And I want to make sure that I derive the most value out of it. So I would highly encourage anybody and everybody to visit us at the pub, quite simply netapp.io. If you visit netapp.com or solidfire.com, you'll find that that is oftentimes the why. Why should I choose ONTAP? Why should I choose E-Series? Why should I choose SolidFire for this particular solution or that particular solution? NetApp.io is the how. If you want to see things like Kapil's presentation, if you want to see the code behind all of that, as well as some other things, all of that is found in NetApp.io. It is also the jumping off point for our open source integrations. Arguably the most beneficial, definitely my favorite feature, is Slack. In a big way, we have gone with Slack. Our engineers, our technical directors, our product managers, the lowly TMEs like myself, we all participate in the Slack channels. And it's a fantastic way to interact with our community. If you're having issues with Trident, if you're having issues with the Docker volume plugin, if you're curious about how different ONTAP platforms, excuse me, NetApp platforms, right, and features work, come and ask us a question. Our community has grown in leaps and bounds. It's been, it was launched roughly Insight last year. And in just over six months, we've grown to well over 500 community users. So it's a fantastic way to interact with us, to influence us. Remember, we're an open source team. That means we're not doing this behind closed doors. That means we are transparent. If you ask us what the roadmap is, we'll probably point you at GitHub. So please, I encourage you to reach out to us. So all of that being said, that is the prepared presentation that I have for you. I don't think anybody wants to see me dance. I don't think anybody wants to hear me <laughs> sing, uh, although I did somehow get convinced to do a carpool karaoke at Insight last year, but it's not pretty, I promise you. <laughs> uh, so I'm happy to take any additional questions, right, anything like that. But if nothing else, thank you very much for your time. More than a question, mine is um, it's a comment. Uh, I hope I got everything right, but uh, uh, my, my impression is that these technologies, this approach, can help to bridge the gap that is a huge gap between cloud native applications that are designed 100% to be uh, running into the cloud, to be designed for failure and so on, and the more traditional legacy applications that use the traditional uh, infrastructure. You were mentioning earlier about this MongoDB cluster using, uh, you know, being aware of uh, this uh, stateful uh, storage. So I started thinking that it, with this, it is possible to, to run, uh, to, to containerize or to make uh, traditional uh, applications evolve and progress progressively move towards a fully 100% cloud, cloud native approach. Th this is, I think, the benefit of uh, Yeah. So. There's a couple of interesting things that I like inside of your statement there, right? So for a long time, I have described platform two applications, right? Traditional client server type applications as being, they, they assume that the infrastructure is infallible, right? The network never goes down. It has zero latency. There is ultimate, right? Infinite throughputs, right? Storage never runs out of gigabytes or IOPS, right? Latency is zero, right? The operating system never has to reboot for patches. And then there's platform three applications, right? Those that are horizontally scaled, that are designed for failure because they know that none of that is true. So when we look at these modern infrastructures, when we look at, well, OpenStack and how it's maturing, when we look at containers and the orchestrators and how they're maturing, right? We're beginning to see the ability to support the concept of lift and shift, 
I want to take a platform two application and put it into a platform three world. Right? Attach things like persistent storage to that that is coming off of, well, an enterprise storage system as opposed to, well, MongoDB, which we don't need to use enterprise storage, but it provides a lot of benefits. Right? I could distribute that across all the local storage on my hosts, but we can get the advantage of both if we choose. So I like to say that right, shadow IT, right, arguably even this concept between, behind hyperscaler clouds, really evolved out of a culture of no inside of IT departments. How often, especially those of us, I was a virtualization administrator, and the apps guys came to me and said, well, we need 40 virtual machines. And my head hits my desk, and I gripe, and I moan, and I complain about, what do you mean you need 40 virtual machines, right? Do you know how many clicks of next, 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 next provision virtual machine that is, right? So we said no. We pushed back. Do you really need 40, or do you really need four, right? Just because we push back, because arguably we're lazy, right? Maybe we don't have the resources internally. That doesn't make their requirement invalid. It doesn't mean that they don't need those resources. So instead, they went elsewhere. They went to AWS, they went to Azure. And it's been wildly successful. It turns out, yeah, that works. It works really, really well, but it's expensive. So now we have IT departments, right? with tools like Kubernetes where it's becoming easier, it's becoming simpler to just enable them, to empower them. Companies like NetApp where we're working to, well, give those application developers, administrators, those capabilities, leveraging on-premises equipment means that we can do it on-prem again. It means that if we want to, we can repatriate that. We can bring it back from the cloud, which sometimes is more economical. Ultimately, we're trying to put power back to the IT administrator, back to the application administrator. I had one, just one quick question for you. I know we talked about Kubernetes for the majority of the time. Is there any um, functionality that I might lose if I go with, say, just Docker Swarm native? So Docker Swarm mode versus using that as the orchestrator versus using Kubernetes? Because I know there's a lot of differences between the two. Yep. Uh, we, I see in the field myself right. uh, more and more adoption for Kubernetes. Right. And I also have customers who are using Docker Swarm right. and the enterprise version of Docker. Yep. And I was on, on a call the other day, and they asked me a question about how do I restrict access uh, or how much storage my, my uh, developer can, can provision. Right. And they are doing that manually today. <coughs> And that's when I realized, okay, Kubernetes is, is a little ahead of the curve at the moment, where I already have things like stateful sets or things like persistent volume, persistent volume claims and quotas and namespaces, yep. which are still developing and maturing in the Docker environment. Yep. So that's what I see. I'm not an expert on both the platforms. I just uh, play around with them at the moment as well. I'm also learning, but this is what I have uh, observed at the moment. Yeah, because obviously, I mean, like volume management and stuff is totally different. Yeah, so Not totally di different, but there are, obviously, on the Kubernetes side, like you said, I mean, it's much more advanced. Yeah. So I was just curious be how much functionality I would lose going, not using Kubernetes, but using Docker Swarm. So if we're talking about the orchestrator, right? Yes, of course orchestrator. They, of course, yes. they have different capabilities, yes. different implementations of things. Yes. Right, so Docker Enterprise Edition, right, the former Docker Data Center, yes. uh, for lack of a better term, is less mature in its understanding of storage, right? As yeah. Kapil mentioned, right, no concept of stateful sets, no concept of uh, uh, quotas, right, et cetera. Uh, when we get below that, if we're talking specifically about persistent storage integration, right, we leverage the Docker Volume plugin. Yeah. So when they create a volume inside of Docker Swarm, right, or Docker Enterprise Edition, it's simply calling down to the Docker Volume plugin and it gets provisioned just like you would expect. So there's no difference at that level? At that level, there is no difference. Okay. At the higher abstraction, there is a little bit. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Uh, 